yours. Nothing says romance like the gift of a kidnapped, injured woman. Buckle up, because we're talking about Stardust, a movie that came out in 2007 based on the book by Neil Gaiman. That's about a boy that's so down bad he's willing to kidnap and traffic a woman. I mean, not really, but you know, it kind of does happen. Anyway, you'll see in a bit. It's got witches, a whole lot of magic, a living star that falls from the sky, brothers constantly trying to murder each other, and a cross-dressing Robert De Niro. And if somehow that doesn't grab your attention, it's also got whatever the hell this is. This movie is bonkers from start to finish. I hadn't seen it since around the time it came out, and after rewatching it, I, I just really want to talk about the entire thing. It starts out with Sir Ian Gandalf McKellen narrating about stars and roasting science as we're introduced to a little village in England called Wall. Because, you know, it's got a little crumbling wall next to it. Only this wall is a barrier to the super special magical land of Stormhold. Dunstan, a boy from Wall, wants to cross the wall and has to get past Grandpa Joe 2.0, who's guarding the wall, who kind of sucks at his job because Dunstan and says, oh, I can't go through, can I? That really blows. I'll just go back home Yeah, now. you know, it really kind of sucks. See you, loser. <laughs> So he crosses the bridge to Terabithia and he finds a little market town with the magic of CGI elephants, googly eyes, and Waman, who sells him a flower for a kiss and tells him, yeah, I'm a princess, I'm enslaved to a witch with the magical rope. So the Dunstan tries to cut that rope, but it just reforms. She's like, yeah, whatever, I'm trapped until she's dead, but don't worry about it. Check out what's in my wagon. And bada bing, bada boom, Dunstan doesn't go back again. And nine months later, a baby gets dropped off on his porch. And in the words of Zuko, that's rough, buddy. He's still pretty chill about it, all things considered. He's just like, oh, hey, a baby, that's cool, I guess. And then 18 years later, that baby turns into a daredevil with 2020 vision or a boy named Tristan Thorne, who has a huge thing for this girl named Victoria, who's clearly not into him. And none other than the man, the myth, and the legend, Henry Cavill is his romantic rival in this movie named Humphrey, hey, which is pretty unfortunate because Geralt of Rivia beats up Tristan in front of his crush and uh, they're like, you good? Yeah. And the girls laugh at him. The thing about Victoria is that she kind of sucks. The next day, she demonstrates she's a master of Karen Jitsu and cuts in front of everyone in line at Tristan's job and is like, hey, can you uh, carry all my stuff and groceries home for me? I know you're working, but that's not a big deal, is it? And because Tristan unlocked all of his simp chakras, he accepts and we get a great jump cut to this. Father, I lost my job. I lost my job, I'm sorry. Naturally, his next step in his five-step program to rejection is to spend all his savings on a nighttime picnic with Victoria, only for her to tell him that Humphrey is gonna propose to her on her birthday, and she just can't be with a shop boy. He's like, I'm not a shop boy. God, I heard, I'm sorry. At the same time, though, the king of all Stormhold lay on his deathbed, scolding his son, saying, I already killed my 11 brothers by your age to take the throne, so you guys should all be killing each other better. With some serious protagonist energy, one of the sons arrives, and the king pulls a Mufasa and is like, hey, Look out the window. What do you see, my son? I see our kingdom, father. Look closer. My kingdom? Maybe. Look up. And he signals to his son Septimus and he pushes him out the window. Father of the century right here. It's explained that it's tradition here for the prince's lives to be a constant battle royale and the last one standing gets to be king, which uh, I guess begs the question, why the hell would you have so many kids? He didn't even care enough to give them real names. He just names them first, second, third, and fourth, and so on, but in Latin. What's kind of fun is we get to see all the ghosts of the killed brothers through throughout the movie, and they only get to pass on once the new king's been found. They're all stuck exactly as they were when they died, so we got one that got frozen, one's burned, one's got an axe to the head, and <laughs> this guy named Secondus who got pushed out the window has his face half smashed. It's it's wild. But the king's like, you know, there's so many of you left. Whoever restores this ruby gets to be king as long as they got royal blood and they touch it, you know, good luck losers, and then he dies. Then the necklace flies to space, nuking a star and knocks it out of the sky, and when Tristan sees it falling, he says he'll bring Victoria the star to prove his love. Victoria says, okay, whatever, you got a week or I'm marrying Superman. Once the star crashes, we get a good look at it and the star is actually a girl in a silk dress because science was right all along. Tristan wasn't the only one who saw the star though because we get introduced to three witches who desperately want to eat the heart of the star to restore their youth because magic. And they straight up got a ferret, which tells them the star is 100 miles away. And they play the witch equivalent of drawing straws by picking ferret organs on who should go, and Michelle Pfeiffer cheats to get the heart, which means she's the winner, I guess. She gets to take what's left of their last star to make the journey and regains most of her youth. She strips naked for fun, and the cameraman fails us. Tristan tries to cross the wall using the same move his dad did, but unbeknownst to him, the guard has aged like fine wine, and Yoda flips over the wall and gives Tristan some brain damage, and is like, yeah, I know kung fu, bitch. But the guard also lets slip that his dad crossed the wall years before, so Tristan goes to ask his dad what that's all about. Turns out his dad never even revealed to Tristan that his mother was on the other side of the wall, and that he's the result of a very unfortunate one-night stand. But he does have a letter for Tristan from his mom that he's never opened that he arrived with. So they open the letter together, and inside, 
inside it is a little magic candle. And in the letter there's instructions that say if he lights the candle and thinks of his mom that he'll be sent straight to her. So he lights the candle and begins to think of his mom and then gets horny and thinks of Victoria and the star so he blasts straight into the star. Uh -huh. When he realizes he he screwed up, the star reveals that she's the star, and he's immediately like, oh, that's great, that's awesome. How would you like to be trafficked as a birthday gift for my one true love? I'm not going anywhere with you. All right, sounds good, let's do it. We cut back to the princes where Septimus, played by Mark Strong, poisons and kills one of his brothers, and right off the bat, we're down to two princes. Back at the star and Tristan, he's like, okay, you don't want to cooperate with me because I'm trying to kidnap you, fine. If we use the last of this candle and I send you back to the sky once I bring you to Victoria, uh, will you come with me? Somehow she believes that and she's like, yeah, okay, fine, let's go. Michelle Pfeiffer, which passes a little farmhouse when she leaves and screws over the life of a guy named Bernard by turning him into a goat to pull her cart until she passes Tristan's mom's witch, who keeps her transformed as a bird now, which I assume acts as a pretty good chastity belt for no more random kids. The cart witch makes the mistake of spicing Michelle Pfeiffer's food with some truth serum and it makes her reveal that she's looking for the star, so she gets super pissed and she reveals that she's Lamia, the queen witch. So she curses her to never be able to see, hear, perceive the star, in any way, shape, or form and says, if I ever see you again, I'm gonna kill you and then pieces out. Also, forgot to mention, every time she uses magic, it takes up a little bit of her youth juice and she gets a little bit older. Back with Tristan, he learns the star's name is Yvain and she's tired because it's the day and stars are only awake at night. Yvain desperately wants to sleep, so uh, he lets her by chaining her to a tree in the middle of the woods and <laughs> my brother in stupidity, what do you think is going to happen to this girl that you just leave out here if anyone else passes? It's the middle of the woods. <laughs> I don't understand. Tristan's so stupid. It's fine, though, because uh, Yvain gets cut free by a unicorn ex machina. Meanwhile, Lamia gets told to stay where she is by her sisters because they got a gator, and so she starts to set a trap. So to prepare, she makes both her goats human. The goat that was a goat goat turns into Arthur Weasley, and he keeps his goat mind, while Bernard gets gender swapped because... Why not, I guess? Anyway, Lamia makes a fake in with some magic and they start to set the trap. I just gotta say, the fact that this guy is not crying in a corner on the ground after being whipped as a goat for miles and then being changed back into himself only to be changed into a woman five seconds later is wild. He seems kind of stoked about it though, so I don't know. No matter what, they're surprisingly willing to help kill some people. After Tristan can't find Yvain again, he gets a little exposition dump from the stars saying that the witches are planning to cut out Yvain's heart, so he gets up and they're like, you gotta get on this next carriage with the prince on it no matter what, so he tries to jump on. Prince was like, what the hell was that? Do you want to die, kid? But somehow he convinces him to let him come along. Yvain arrives at the fake inn and farm boy girl creeps and undresses her when Lamia heals her leg in a bath and then she gets ready to cut out her heart right before she's about to go to bed, right when Tristan and the prince arrive at the front door. The prince named Primus sees a bath and without even talking to the owners, once he steps in, just hops right on in. So Lamia tries to poison him, but he's not about it because he just saw his brother get poisoned just barely. So he's like, yeah, no, give it to my friend in the stables. When Tristan gets the cut, up, he asks Farm Boy Girl's name, Bernard. which he just takes in stride. And back inside, Yvain starts to talk to Primus, and all the brothers are watching and saying, Brother, she's wearing the, the necklace. Brother, she's right. wearing the necklace. Until he finally notices it. Oh, yeah. finally. Right as Tristan's about to drink the poison Kool-Aid, the unicorn busts out and knocks it out of his hand and he sees that it fries the ground. Lamia decides, you know what, screw this, and grabs her hidden knife, walks downstairs, and as Tristan comes back in and say, hey, you know, they're trying to murder us, she just slits Primus's throat right in front of everybody. Which, you know, is a questionable tactic to get somebody to stay and be happy at your place, but hey, uh, <laughs> Primus bleeds blue for some reason and Arthur Weasley gets called out to fight the unicorn and gets KO'd so hard that he dies on impact and turns back into a goat. In response to this, the unicorn gets flu powder flamed and it either dies or ditches, but uh, we never see it again, so I'm assuming it died. And as the witch nears Tristan and Yvain, Tristan turns to her and says, Hold me tight, nothing can And he sticks the candle into the fire to escape. The next moment, they're standing on a cloud because each of them thought of their own home, so they ended up between the two. And Tristan has the audacity to say these words. Who are you stupid cow? What did you think of your heart for? In the words of Gordon Ramsay, you absolute donkey. You told her to five seconds ago, man. <laughs> but they get rescued by some sky pirates who are up here because they're fishing for lightning because they're awesome. And they're led by Captain Shakespeare, or in other words, Robert De Niro. Septimus finds his dead brother and is like, I'm king! 
Damn, I still need the necklace. When he finds Bernard hiding under a thing and he's like, where's my stone? Oh yeah, there was this witch who was trying to eat the heart of a star. I could live forever. So now he wants to eat the heart of the star. Now we're gonna go through a lot really quickly. So hold on to your butts. Robert De Niro pretends to kill Tristan to appear tough to his crew. when in reality, he's a sweet man of the arts who's also a cross dresser. He gives him a makeover and cuts his hair until it's long. It's not extensions because it happens in one single cut. I don't know how it happens. We're just gonna call it magic and move on. They sell lightning to Ricky Gervais in port. And when they get back to the ship, Tristan is chilling. Captain Shakespeare calls him his nephew and they take him on their way and they get into a maturity montage and he learns to sword fight from Robert De Niro. So while that's all happening, Ricky Gervais gets questioned by Lamia about where the star is. Yeah, I can get you anything you want. I can get you a three-headed dog. I can get you some orc seed. It, Shut really, up. And she curses him to never be able to talk with anything but animal noises for the rest of his life. But that ends up not being very long because Septimus rolls up and is like, Are you mocking me? So Mark Strong murders Ricky Gervais. What a freak. Captain Shakespeare sends Yvain and Tristan on their way and leaves them with a bit of lightning in a bottle with Septimus close on their tail. Shortly after, he catches up to Captain Shakespeare and busts into his private chambers while he's having an epic full drag session, but his crew rushes in and saves him while Septimus jumps out a window. They tell him they always knew he was like this and they love him just the way he is. So, you know, pretty epic for 2007. Then Septimus ditches Bernard, ending his saga of insanity, and Lamia tries to fix some face wrinkles, but trades them for some saggy flapjacks when Tristan and Yvain run into his mom's witch on the road. She recognizes Tristan's dad's flower on his jacket and is like, that's me flower. And Tristan's like, it's me lucky charm. But he'll give it to her if she takes him to the wall. And she agrees and then basically says, very cool idiot. That was protecting you from magic. Now be a mouse dweeb. Yvain's like, why I oughta beat the hell out of you? Take this and that and what sorcery is this? But Lamia's curse keeps her from interacting with the witch in any way, shape or form. And she's basically invisible to her. So she just rides in the back of the cart with Tristan and feeds him some cheese. And this is where she decides to confess to Tristan that she's deeply in love with him now and that Victoria doesn't care about him. I, I, I don't really know what Tristan did to deserve this confession, but you know, if a guy is willing to enslave and gift you to another girl, then, then maybe you should uh, question your feelings for them. Also, it has been less than a week since they met, since that was the time frame that Victoria gave them and, and they're apparently on schedule. But but you know, Yvain's all in. The witch does keep her word though and turns Tristan back and drops him off at a town near Wall and they spend the night at an inn. Uh, Yvain takes a bath and Tristan pokes his head in going full peeping Tom and it's like, hey, you're in my bed. Bath, which is a weird move by Tristan. Kind of creepy, but hey, I guess it works out for him because he tells her that he heard what she said when they were on the cart, which leads to a very in-depth lesson in astronomy. One of the ghost princes pokes his head out the wall and is like, guys, you gotta see this. And his brothers call him a pervert. A lot of, a lot of creepiness going on around here. The next morning, Tristan gets the bright idea to cut a lock of Yvain's hair while she sleeps, which is super weird. Gonna give some friendly advice and just say never do that. But he decides he's gonna complete his quest and bring back a piece of the star to Victoria and tell her he's not interested. Tristan, as always though, chooses is the dumbest possible way to do things. He leaves Yvain without waking her and leaves a message with the innkeeper who's clearly high. Brother, why? Victoria doesn't care. Even when you do get there, you, you're giving her a piece of hair. It's gonna be super weird. At the very least, you could have said where he's going. It annoys me, because obviously the innkeeper gets the message wrong and tells Yvain Tristan went to spend his life with Victoria, his one true love, which is definitely not what he said. So Yvain gets all sad and starts to go after Tristan slowly, who does make it back to Victoria, no problem. He hands her the handkerchief and she says, it's so small, whatever, it's not the star I want. You know what I want? And she goes in for a kiss and Tristan grabs her and bends her over and says, yeah, you want to grow up and get over yourself. And then just drops her on the ground. <laughs> Henry Cavill sees this and is like, you want to die? So they have a dick measuring contest and Humphrey gives up. Then Victoria opens up the handkerchief and says, why would I want this? It's just a bunch of stardust. Roll credits, bada bing, bada boom. But you know, hold the applause because Tristan realizes that if Yvain crosses the border, she's gonna die. So he starts racing back to the entrance. His mom also saw Yvain leaving. So she Grand Theft Autos her witch's cart and chases after her. We get a little epic montage of everybody racing to see who's gonna stop Yvain from crossing first until... Bam, Tristan's mom is the first to get there and grabs her right before she's about to step over. Now, there's only two theories that make sense here. Either Yvain is pretty much deaf and didn't hear Tristan's mom rolling a card at her and calling for her to stop, or Tristan's mom snuck up to her all stealthy and quiet until grabbing Yvain. Either way, cutting it real close just for the sake of suspense. The next to arrive is Lamia, who sees the other witch and decides to avada cadaver her head off and then she disintegrates. Then she captures Tristan's mom and Yvain and takes them back to her witch house. Tristan passes the guard who's like, I'm out of here, that was fucking crazy. And tells Tristan what happened so he chases after them and arrives at the witch's house along with Septimus. What are you doing here? I know you are, but what am I? 
Touche. So they decide to work together and they bust on in, ready to kill everybody until Septimus immediately recognizes Tristan's mom and calls her Una. Lisa. Turns out she's the missing princess and his sister. So while Una runs over to Tristan saying that she's his mother, Septimus gets flame blasted and hit with a heat metal spell. Thankfully though, he's pretty flame resistant and counters by just chucking his sword through the witch. And she gives a little chuckle and then dies. But that's when Lamia decides to pull out the cheat code known as Voodoo Doll and breaks Septimus's arm and leg and then drops it in some water. He begins to float and then slowly drowns in the air and it's just so creative. I really love what they did here. It's just gotta be one of like the most unique death scenes I've ever seen. After Septimus is dead though, Tristan frees the abused animals and they kill the other witch before Lamia starts to fight herself, but she can't use magic on him because he got his flower back. There's some wild sentences this movie's making me say. I'm just realizing that. <laughs> anyway, he blasts Lamia with his lightning in a bottle that he got from Captain Shakespeare, and she flies backwards, and then she finds Septimus's voodoo doll in the water and starts to puppet him, and they have this crazy choreographed fight where Septimus's dead body fights Tristan, and it's, it's the craziest looking fight scene ever. It's awesome. Tristan wins the fight, though, by dropping a chandelier on Septimus and uses the gravity to fly over and tackle Lamia, where he quickly gets his ass handed to him, and she puts a knife to his neck. Then, using about as many brain cells as a block of cheese, she decides to cut your vein free for a cheap fake out to start the fight again just as soon as they walk down the stairs. It's explained earlier in the movie I guess that the star needs to be happy when she cuts out her heart for it to have the most effect so maybe that's what they were going for here but she starts to try to murder them to their faces five seconds later though still so I don't know how that really holds up. In any case it doesn't really matter because Yvain has unlocked the ability of true love which means that she can shine so bright that she can just disintegrate Lamia now so she explodes and that's the climax. Just in the and reasonably asks, why didn't you do that earlier? And she says, uh, I couldn't have done it without you because no star can shine with a broken heart. I'm too lazy to nitpick the details there, so we're just gonna go with it. Tristan picks up the ruby, and as he touches it, it turns red, because cha-ching, he's Una's son, he's got royal blood because of that, and he's the last living male heir to the throne. The princes get freed, and Tristan gets coronated as king, and may God have mercy on his subjects if his decision-making has shown anything. Pretty much everybody shows up to the coronation. Henry Cavill and Robert De Niro might have a thing going on, which is one of the best things I've ever seen. And then Una gives Yvain and Tristan a magic candle, and they rule for for about 80 years before Tristan and Yvain decide to go back to the sky because Tristan had Yvain's heart, so to speak, he could live forever. Which I guess means everybody should have just been trying to seduce the star this whole time because it's got the same effect as eating her heart. But uh, they light the candle and they go to the stars. And they still live happily ever after. A few hundred million miles apart from each other if science has taught me anything. But I think there's a few things we can glean from this movie, uh, especially the main morals. Uh, don't kidnap people and Stockholm Syndrome is scary. <laughs>